Hi class, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the last half lecture of the quarter. So it's been a long quarter uh, and uh, we've covered a lot of ground, but we finally reached the end. Uh, I'm a little sad that we're almost done. Uh, it's been especially difficult this quarter not seeing you all all the time, uh, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you have stayed safe and uh, I hope we have a chance to see each other sometime in the future when you come home to Northwestern if you're graduating or uh, in the future year when you come back and we're back on campus together. So let's talk about starships here for the last lecture of the quarter. So in the background behind me is probably the closest thing to a starship that we've ever developed. This is one of the space shuttles. This is Enterprise. Uh, Enterprise was famously named after a famous starship uh, of the same name after a write-in campaign by fans of the Star Trek show. Enterprise was the first space shuttle to fly in the air. That is, it was used for all the glide tests, uh, but it never went into space. It was a test article only. It is currently on display uh, at the Smithsonian and you can go visit it. You can see me down there uh, in, the, uh, in the foreground to, for a sense of scale. But uh, the space shuttles really were the closest thing to starships that we've had so far. They were places where astronauts could go to space, they could live for weeks at a time, they could work, they could do the things that we imagine we would do if we ever go to space. But let's talk about starships that are designed to take us much farther from the Earth than even the space shuttles or the Apollo astronauts went, okay? So let me start a few slides. So this uh, initial image here, uh, this is a cover off of one of my favorite books. When I was a kid, um, my mother uh, got me this book from National Geographic, which was called Our Universe uh, by Roy Gallant, who is an outstanding uh, science writer. Uh, he wrote many, many books for, for citizens and scientists uh, during his uh, heyday, uh, but this was one of them. And I've shown you a couple of pictures from uh, this book before, but this is the cover, a starship directly on the cover uh, in that kind of classic 70s sci-fi style uh, that it was. So um, starships have long held people's imagination. They uh, come in every shape and size that you can imagine because we've never really designed a proper starship. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we've never built a proper starship. So we don't really know what they might look like. And so people let their imaginations uh, come together to imagine what they might be. They take things that they know about spacecraft we have built or about aircraft we have built and imagine how those uh, experiences might morph their way into um, starships. Uh, there is perhaps no more creative community on this front than the Lego community. And those of you know uh, uh, that I have a certain affinity for Lego. So I wanted to show you just a few starships from uh, the Lego world. So these are all built by uh, Lego builders around uh, the world over the years. I collect all the cool ones that I see and all of them are really outstanding. But you can see the variety in form and function of uh, starships that you can imagine uh, we, might, we might someday build. And how they might work and where they might go is also subject to our imagination. But the LEGO community has certainly been very robust with their, uh, with their uh, designs, uh, just like the people who imagine uh, starships uh, for real. So if you are interested in this topic, then, whoops, sorry, clicked again. If you're interested in this topic, then this is the single most uh, useful book I have ever seen. It's a very comprehensive book uh, about all the different ideas that people have proposed about real starships that could really go to the stars. Um, it is a public level book, so there's lots of prose that you can read. And if you are even slightly technically interested, it has boxed off mathematical calculations to kind of help you understand and show you how uh, starship calculations go. There's a little bit of relativity in there. There's a little bit of fuel calculations in there. There's a little travel time in there. All of that sort of stuff is in the box. But if you just want to read and uh, have nice pictures and have the different starship designs uh, described to you, this is the book that I always point people to. Uh, and I love this book. Um, I have multiple copies of it so that I can have a copy at work all the time and a copy at home uh, so I can loan it to people. 
Um, so uh, there are lots and lots of different designs in this book, and today we're only going to talk about three. The three that I mentioned to you uh, today will be the three that uh, your book chapter actually covers when you, um, when you read about this. So let's start with why do we care about starships? So the first thing I'd like to point out is something that a lot of us try to reiterate over and over again. There is no planet B out there in the universe. There is no place for our species to retreat to because we need another home. Escaping to the stars is not a way to circumvent our own destruction of the planet. If climate change runs away and we destroy the biosphere, there is not another place for us to go. No planet is as well suited to life as we know it, to life, Earth life like ourselves, than planet Earth itself. And so while the idea of going to the stars is entrancing, and we can imagine there might be worlds like Earth out there, uh, there are no known planets like Earth. And even if there were, they almost certainly will have life of their own, and it is uh, ethically, I think, not correct for us as a species to invade that, invade that world. So uh, there is no planet B, but uh, from the perspective of, of preserving life on Earth, in the long run, it will be necessary to leave the planet because as the sun evolves, the habitable zone is going to move. In about a billion years, Earth will be on the inner edge of the habitable zone and our oceans will begin to boil away. Life as we know it will not be possible on the planet any longer at that time. And so if any species on Earth is going to survive uh, that transition, then it will be necessary uh, to, to somehow travel to the stars. Uh, the sun, of course, will die in about 5 billion years, and then all life in the solar system, no matter where it is, uh, will, will certainly perish at that time. Okay, now this is the reality of the universe, right? Every star system that has ever had life, and we've certainly talked about this uh, as in our astrobiology journey, uh, has had to face up against this. And so almost certainly there are plenty of life, uh, life forms and plenty of civilizations uh, that have perished over the years because uh, this transition never happens, okay? So let's talk about starships in general though. So getting to starship speeds, and what I mean by starship speeds are speeds that you can use to get to another star, is not hard, okay? And I'm gonna put big air quotes around the statement, is not hard. Um, all you have to do is hold the accelerator down a little uh, longer. So this is just like in your car, you push the accelerator a little bit, you go a little bit fast. If hold it down for multiple seconds, you go a little bit faster. If you hold it down, just stomp it to the floor and keep it there, then you go really, really fast. And starships are going to be the same way, okay? So the statement is, if you push your accelerator, you'll increase in speed. And the question is, how long does it take you to reach the final speed listed over there in the left-hand column, okay? A, tenth, a hundredth the speed of light, 5% the speed of light, 10% the speed of light, 25% the speed of light or 50% the speed of light, okay? The letter C is physicist's shorthand for the speed of light, okay? Now, there's two different ways we can accelerate. We can accelerate like a great sports car, zero to 60 in five seconds, or we can accelerate at 1G. And what we mean by accelerating at 1G is that when you're accelerating, like if you're in a rocket, that the force that you're pushed back to the, uh, uh, into your seat with is equivalent to the force you feel right now sitting in your chair at your desk. Okay, that's a kind of standard number that we like to think about in starship travel because if you're in a starship uh, accelerating, 1G is a useful acceleration because it makes it convenient and useful for any passengers that happen to be on the starship. Okay, so here's what that table looks like. If you want to go at 1% the speed of light, you only have to accelerate like a sports car for six and a half days. Okay. If you want to accelerate at 1G, you only have to do it in about half that time, okay, 3.6 days. Okay, so you can look down the table and you can see that if you want to go faster and faster and faster, you have to accelerate longer. So at half the speed of light, down at the very bottom, you would have to accelerate like a sports car for 267 days or accelerate at 1G for 146 days, for a significant fraction of a year. But if you could do that, if you could carry enough fuel and build an engine that could do it, then at the end of that time, you would be traveling at half the speed 
of light. Okay. Now, what goes hand in hand with that is if you want to slow down, you have to accelerate with your engine pointing the other direction for the same amount of time. Okay. And we'll come back to that point. Now, nothing stops us from building ships that can do this. And I'll show you some of the examples of that at the, at the end of the lecture here. The only thing that stops us is money and time. Okay? Money, of course, is the thing that stops everything in the world because money's become important somehow. Okay? Time is the other point uh, because it takes a long time to develop the technology. It takes a long time to build the technology. It takes a long time to train someone to fly such a starship. We have no experience with that. All of those things will, will build up. Okay? Um, the starship, uh, any starship design that we talk about has to be assembled in orbit. That's one of the reasons it's so expensive. Um, and special relativity, while it's going to be beneficial to us, okay, once we get going, I can travel at higher speeds, I can travel anywhere I want in the universe within a human lifetime, okay? But getting to the point where we can approach the endeavor is what's going to take a long, long time. Okay, if I just think about things like the space shuttle there in the background, space shuttles, it took 20 years for us to design and build them uh, and get them into space. A starship is going to be far more complicated. Okay? So what kinds of options do we have? Well, if you don't want to deal with going really, really fast, you can always decide you're going to take the trip slow. Okay, I'm gonna travel at the speed of my Yugo. And you and I have done these calculations before. Driving in my Yugo, it will take me 7,000 years to get to Pluto. Okay, we could do that. There's nothing stopping us. And there are ways to do that. One of the ways to do that that we talk about all the time is hypersleep. Okay, we have no idea what that means. Okay, but we know because we can see it happen in nature that it's possible to slow your metabolism down. Bears hibernate, chipmunks go into torpor, uh, lungfish bury themselves in the mud and wait, wait out the season. Tardigrades can freeze and unfreeze, okay? In principle, it's possible to slow your metabolism down so that your heart beats once a week, who knows what, and allows you to survive the long trip to the stars. The other thing you could imagine is generational starships, and this is a, a standard trope in science fiction. We build a starship where all of us can live out our lives inside. We build universities and, and, and uh, swimming pools and uh, trails for hiking and mountain biking on. We go take our hang gliders with us. We play tennis. We do all of those things that we want to do. But we just live on the starship while it travels to the stars. You and I grow old. We have kids. We die. Our kids carry out their lives. They grow old. They die. Our grandkids carry out their lives. They grow old. They die. Our great-grandkids are still alive when we reach the reach wherever the destination of the starship is, okay? That's entirely possible. Science fiction, of course, takes that uh, to heart, and there's many questions about that. Is it ethical for us to consign our children to a starship journey that I wanted to make that I'm not going to live to see the end of? What happens if uh, society breaks down on the starship as we travel to the stars? That's a good question, considering what's going on in the world today. Um, there's all kinds of problems with those ideas. But nonetheless, it's an example of an idea that people have thought about for how it would be possible for humanity to travel from here in the solar system to out there somewhere else in the galaxy. Okay? Of course, the way for you and I personally to go is to go fast. Because if I go fast, then special relativity takes over, time dilation comes into effect, and my personal internal clock ticks slowly and allows me to survive the long journey between the stars. On the starship, the trip will be short. Only a month will pass, or a week will pass, or a year will pass. But for those left behind, tremendous time passes. If I depart on a relativistic starship for the stars, everyone I know, everyone I've seen, everything I've, I've experienced and places I've been, my countries, my schools, my towns, they will be gone by the time I can return to Earth. Okay, that is the penalty for being a starship traveler under the precept of special relativity. Okay, but if you do time dilation, if you accept it, what does a journey to the stars look like? If you go fast enough, you can reach the stars before you die. 
Okay, so if your final speed is uh, 0.1 C, 10% the speed of light, how long would it take you to get to Alpha Centauri, only 4.3 light years away, or to the center of the galaxy, 24,000 light years away? And what I mean by how long is I mean how long does your wristwatch traveling with you, your heartbeat traveling with you on the ship experience time passing by the time you reach Alpha Centauri or the center of the Milky Way? So at 10% the speed of light, it takes you 42.8 years to reach Alpha Centauri, okay? So if a human being lives uh, 100 years, then I still have time traveling on a starship at 10% the speed of light to reach Alpha Centauri and see what it's like, okay? If you left when you were a child, just starting kindergarten, you would be able to go to Alpha Centauri, look around for a little while, come home to Earth, before you reach the age of 100. The center of the galaxy, however, is still really, really far away, 239,000 years, ship time, okay? At half the speed of light, the journey to Alpha Centauri gets interesting, seven years, okay? So if you had left for Alpha Centauri when you were a kindergartner, by the time you got there, you would be in seventh grade, you could write a nice report, turn around, come back to Earth, and deliver it in your sophomore English composition class here at Northwestern, okay? 14 years round trip, 15 years round trip, traveling at half the speed of light, okay? Center of the galaxy, still way too far away. Okay, but what if I really push it? I push up to 0.9 times the speed of light. At 0.9 times the speed of light, I can get to Alpha Centauri in two years. In two years, if you left for Alpha Centauri when you were a freshman, we said, see everybody, this Northwestern class is going for study abroad for four years at Alpha Centauri. We spent two years traveling to Alpha Centauri. We spend a few months looking around while we're there. We spend two years coming back. We get back in time for graduation. It, it's, it's what's possible if you uh, look at special relativity, okay? Now, I say get back in four years for graduation, okay? But Alpha Centauri is 4.3 years away. So even though you and I think it only took four years to everyone on Earth, they think it took eight. So you would not graduate with your class when you got back. You generate, you'd graduate with the class that's four years behind you, okay? Center of the galaxy, still too far away, okay? If we could go 0.99999 the speed of light, we can get to Alpha Centauri in six tenths of a year. Okay, so just under a month. And if we could go 0.9999969 six nines times the speed of light, we could get to Alpha Centauri in two days. Okay, even though you and I could reach Alpha Centauri in two days, two sleeps, we could explore the whole place around Alpha Centauri for a year, we'd come home still. Eight, eight, nine years would have passed here on Earth, okay? But for us, it would have only taken two days aboard the Starship. Now, this last number here is the most interesting because there you finally see that the amount of time on board the ship is short enough that we could imagine going to the center of the galaxy. Why would I want to do that? There's a giant black hole at the center of the galaxy. Wouldn't that be awesome to see? We could travel to the center of the galaxy and take a selfie with the giant black hole that's there. I would love that, okay? But by the time we got back to Earth, 50,000 years would have passed. 24,000 years to get there, 24,000 years to get home, okay? Pretty sure Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, all those things are gonna be gone by the time we get back from our trip to the center of the galaxy, okay? So special relativity makes the journey possible. You can personally survive and experience the journey but to everyone you left behind, they will be long gone, okay? So what are the obstacles to doing this? The really biggest obstacle is fuel, okay? If you've studied any kind of going to outer space propulsion at all, you know that uh, this is the Saturn V here, the rocket that we use to get off the Earth and to outer space is mostly just a big tube full of fuel. The astronauts lived in the little small capsule there at the top of the Saturn V rocket, but the entire 370 whatever feet of it that was left after that 
uh, was completely dedicated to fuel. Okay, and so this problem is true, just getting off the surface of the Earth. It's even more true trying to get out to the stars. You need enormously powerful engines if you're going to travel at close to the speed of light. And if you're going to have enormously powerful engines, there has to be a huge fuel supply uh, to drive those engines. Okay, so as a consequence of that, most real Starship designs start with ideas about how is the propulsion going to work. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about the three classic designs that people always like to talk about because they are, in principle, the technically the most feasible based on technologies we understand. It. Okay, so this is the first of them. This is called Daedalus. Okay, so Daedalus uh, is mostly fuel. That's those big tanks you see there. Uh, it is designed to travel to Alpha Centauri. That's the star you can see there in the background. Um, it gets at very close to the speed of light. So you see there's a big shield there on the front of it that's designed to block uh, whatever's uh, the passengers and payload on it uh, from oncoming cosmic rays, which will be devastating to you traveling at very high the speed of light. Okay, so what is Daedalus? This is what Daedalus looks like built out of Lego. Okay, so it was a starship design designed by the British Interplanetary Society. It was a five-year study they conducted in the mid-1970s. The idea was to design a starship that could be powered by nuclear fusion. Okay, so this is the power that's at the center of the stars. You take hydrogen, you bind it together to make helium, and one of the outputs is extra energy. That energy can serve as propulsion. Okay, now in order for the fusion to work, you need the fuel. And so the fuel contained in those big tanks there is 50,000 tons of a special form of hydrogen called deuterium, and it would have to be mined from Jupiter, okay? And so here you see what we were talking about, the long timelines involved. Not only do we have to design and build a starship, but we have to design the technology and the capability to mine the fuel we need from the atmosphere of Jupiter in order to make this uh, starship go. Okay, but you can imagine that it might happen. The uh, tritium is fused into pellets, which are exploded together uh, the way we explode atomic bombs. You explode about 250 of those per second, uh, and uh, 450 tons of fuel, uh, oh, sorry, 50,000 tons of fuel can move 450 tons of payload. Okay, so that's humans, food, scientific equipment, probes, whatever you want to send to Alpha Centauri. Okay, you can get going to about 12% the speed of light. Okay, and so possible destinations that people have imagined are Barnard Star or Alpha Centauri. So the schematic of Daedalus looks like this. The payload is just that top part there on the extreme upper left. There you can see there's our fuel pods and an engine. Down below is a much larger set of fuel pods and an engine. This is actually two stages, just like a Saturn V rocket. So you have a gigantic initial stage that really gets you going, you drop it, and then you have uh, a second stage that once you're going very fast, you can push a little bit harder. You don't have to carry all the extra mass of that stage that you started with. Just like Saturn V rocket, we drop it, leave it behind because we don't need it. Okay, so you can see all the diagrams there. The crew or uh, scientific instruments live right up there at the very top uh, behind the, uh, uh, the uh, deflection shield. Okay, okay. So what does the journey look like? So the travel time to Alpha Centauri, it's just over 10% the speed of light, is about 40 years. So again, if you're a human traveler in this expedition, you can make it to Alpha Centauri in a human life. Okay, so down there below, what you see is the uh, uh, profile. So you see for the first two years, you accelerate with the first stage. The first stage shuts down, you discard it, and then for the next two years, you accelerate with the second stage, okay? And then after those first four years, you travel for the next 36 years toward the Alpha Centauri. Okay, so you better take a lot of books on your Kindle, or you have to be in hypersleep, or you have to not send humans at all, okay? Once you are getting close, maybe 15 years out, you're far closer to Alpha Centauri than, and able to see it better than any telescope from Earth can, so scientific observations begin. When you're about 10 years out, you deploy probes, okay? So scientific probes that will enter the Alpha Centauri system, slow down, perhaps land on planets or orbit planets the way probes do here on Earth, and they will study the planets of that system, 
okay? Now, what you should notice about this timeline is that there's no slowing down. Daedalus is a one-way trip. It accelerates, it gets going up to 10% the speed of light, but it does not carry the necessary fuel or equipment to slow down, nor the necessary fuel or equipment to return to Earth. It's a one-way trip, okay? But after 40 years, the data gets back to Earth after 4.6 years. <coughs> so if I leave now, by the time I'm 100, I'll arrive at Alpha Centauri, I can take a selfie of myself, beam it back to Earth, my daughter will get it when she's sometime in her 60s, okay? Okay, the next Starship idea uh, is one called Orion, okay? So Orion's uh, one of the most famous ones, is one of the very first serious Starship ideas uh, that people uh, thought about. We call it a Starship idea, we include it here with this, but it's really only really good for uh, exploring the solar system, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. The basic idea uh, is that you have some payload up at the top, and then down at the bottom, you have a fuel module, okay, the thing labeled propellant magazines there. The propellant for this starship is traditional atomic bombs, nuclear weapons, okay, and in the back, is a very fancy structure that basically consists of shock absorbers and a big plate, okay, what we call the pusher plate, okay? And the idea is, is you drop an atomic bomb down through a little hole in the middle of the pusher plate. It explodes behind the pusher plate, and since you're hiding behind the plate, you're protected from the explosion. It pushes, the explosion pushes the plate forward, compressing the shock absorbers, and then the shock absorbers expand and push you forward. Okay, so that's the basic idea, okay? So here's Orion built out of Lego. Okay, so this was an idea that was developed in the late 1950s and early 1960s. It's powered by traditional nuclear fission uh, atomic bombs, so they're dangerous. There's a dangerous byproduct, radioactive uh, byproducts. Um, because it's based on nuclear bombs, much of the research about Orion is still classified, okay? But they built a test vehicle called Hot Rod. I'll show you a video of that in a minute. Uh, where they tested it with uh, uh, standard explosives, dynamite, grenades, that sort of thing, okay? The idea was you wanted to make the solar system easily accessible, uh, and I guess in principle to make uh, nuclear weapons useful for something. Uh, and because it has a nuclear engine, the payload capacity is tremendous. You can imagine sending huge scientific uh, experiments, huge scientific base stations to the planets, to Mars uh, in particular. Uh, using this kind of technology, okay? So the demonstrator was called Hot Rod, and so the idea was just to show that this whole pusher plate uh, shock absorber thing uh, works, okay? So this is the Hot Rod uh, test vehicle here on the left, and so they use traditional explosives rather than nuclear explosives to show that it works. Here's the movie of the Hot Rod, so you can see boom, 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 boom. Each boom pushes it a little higher up, and so they successfully showed that this kind of bizarre pusher plate uh, idea works. It didn't go very high. Uh, you can see it par parachuting back there at the end of the test flight. But they showed that this pusher idea uh, works. And if you take general physics, you'll learn about conservation of momentum and Newton's third law and all those sorts of things. Uh, you can kind of analyze this kind of system and convince yourself that it works. Here's a movie about what an Orion-style uh, trip to Mars might look like. Uh, you could make the trip to Mars under Orion uh, and back in only 250 days. Okay, so if you watch The Martian, you know that sometimes it takes a long time, roughly twice that, to get to Mars and back uh, by kind of conventional means. So the idea is you'll have the Orion Starship launch from the surface of the Earth using traditional rockets. You see here uh, solid rocket boosters, which were used on the space shuttle and will be part of the space launch system uh, that is being developed for return to the moon. Uh, those are reusable, so they kind of parachute off and return to Earth after uh, Orion gets high up. Once it's in orbit, it exposes the nuclear pusher plate part of the engine. You start exploding nuclear bombs, and in this movie, awful close to Earth, I think, but uh, this is one of the detriments to the Orion concept, is that you're kind of exploding an awful lot of nuclear weapons and leaving that radioactive waste behind, uh, one of the reasons why this may never happen. Uh, but uh, once you're moving, uh, you stop uh, the propulsion phase, 
you extend the big arms and you begin to rotate the spacecraft. So rotation is one of the ways that you can produce artificial gravity for astronauts, and that's really important uh, for extended journeys in space. We know there's lots of detrimental effects to being exposed to zero G for long periods of time. Uh, so uh, rotation where you experience some gravity is, uh, is useful. When you get to Mars, you pull those booms back in and you do the exact opposite thing. You explode some nuclear bombs to slow you down. That pusher plate is strong enough to withstand nuclear explosions, which means it's also strong enough to withstand entry into the Martian atmosphere. So you plunge into the Martian atmosphere, you use that pusher plate as a, uh, a heat shield. It slows you down to the point where you can land under conventional rockets, which is one of the methods by which we land landers uh, on the surface of Mars now. You land under conventional rockets and you touch down softly on the surface of Mars, okay? Now, in this particular realization in movie, there is no clear indication of how you get back, uh, but people who think about these things, uh, I'm sure have mechanisms for that as well, okay? Okay, so the last Starship concept is really one for going to the stars and starting and stopping and doing whatever you might imagine you might want to do. And so this is called a Bussard ramjet, okay? It is also a fusion powered, uh, concept, but what they do is they get rid of the fuel problem, okay? And so the way you do that is you have that gigantic scoop in the front. That's actually a magnetic deflector. It generates an enormous magnetic field that stretches out well beyond the boundaries of the scoop itself. And what you do is you scoop up hydrogen, which is the most common element in the galaxy. There's about one hydrogen atom per cubic meter uh, in interstellar space. You scoop all of that up, it funnels it down to the uh, ship, and then you use that for fusion fuel, okay? So this is the general configuration for the Bussard ramjet idea. There is a habitation section there or a payload section in the middle. If humans go, that's where you live. If you send science instruments, that's where they live. That enormous magnetic torus is out in front. It gathers that hydrogen fuel. It pipes it down through the center of the habitation section to the engine, uh, which is in the background. And that also is a fusion engine, okay? So you take hydrogen, you make helium and energy. Okay, so the idea here that Bussard had is bypass all the problems that you have with uh, Daedalus. You just scoop up the fuel you need, then you don't have to carry big tanks. You have fuel on demand, so you can slow down, you can speed up, you can flip the ship over and slow down, stop wherever you are, get going again, go to someplace new, come back however you like. Okay, so this is the idea of the Bussard ramjet. This is probably the most difficult technology because we don't know how to build that gigantic, enormous magnetic torus that we need. I mean, in principle, we can figure out how to do it because we understand magnetism, but the technology to do it is certainly uh, far outside the boundaries of anything that we've tried to do so far. Okay, okay, so these are just a few of the Starship ideas. You could get that Starflight handbook book. Uh, there are many other ideas in there. You've probably heard of many others your, yourselves involving solar sails, uh, involving laser propulsion. There's all kinds of different ideas people have had. Um, and if you're interested, you can certainly do a little bit more extensive reading about that. Okay? But that is the end. And so I would like to take us back to where we started. Right? So we started our study of astrobiology by recognizing that this was the only example of, of a world where we know with certainty there is life. And despite the fact that we can imagine and we are learning more about the universe and more about other planets and about other worlds, this is still the only planet we know with life. As we have said many times, and I think is uh, uh, true, and I hope you think is true, uh, the whole endeavor to study astrobiology is really a very sophisticated way about reflecting on our own lives here on the Earth. Learning about astrobiology and learning about other places in the universe where life may, might exist gives us a new perspective to understand the one place where we do know life exists. And so for no other reason than it gives us the ability to appreciate how fragile and how important uh, the fact that life exists here on Earth is, is probably, I think, still the most important reason for studying astrobiology. 
So I think to close the course, I would like to leave you uh, with this quote. Uh, Kalpana Chawla was one of the astronauts on STS-107, Space Shuttle Columbia. She tragically died uh, with her crewmates when Columbia was returning to Earth. But one of the things that she said about her experiences in the astronaut corps and, and thinking about uh, humanity traveling into space was that she's always felt that a connection and stewardship for Earth for as long as she could remember, and not just for Earth, but for the whole universe. And I think that sentiment is one that I certainly feel very deeply as a consequence of my study of astronomy, and certainly with all that's going on in the world today, um, I think all of us, hopefully all of us, can appreciate um, the fragility uh, of our civilization and uh, our lives here on this planet. And so take it to heart, use the lessons that we've learned here uh, for your own edification and to do good in the world. Uh, I am very sad that we aren't uh, together uh, through all of this, so I hope you all are staying safe. When you do get back to campus, please do stop by and say hello. I would love to meet you all in person. Uh, that's all we're going to do in astrobiology this quarter. So uh, please do take care of yourselves. If you have questions or uh, interesting thoughts, please don't hesitate to share them. I hope to see you all again sometime in the near future. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>